everything is gonna change. God didn't call you here to leave you. God didn't give you the vision to plant. God didn't put this church here for a, have to worry about paving a parking lot. God can take care of that too, amen? God's promises are yea and amen. We're children of God, that's who we are. And I'm here today to tell you, you're a child of God. And the promises of God are yea and amen. Psalms chapter 139, looking from verse number one, Psalms 139, again, it is a delight to be here with you. And uh, I, I will tell you, there is hope coming. We've got some districts that are gonna be giving some money this week to this church. And I believe God's gonna do some things in Gibson and, and uh, uh, I, there's going to be a great church, and that's just the beginning. There's going to be churches planted all over Colorado as a result of the vision and the passion of your pastor and, and this district and this church. Amen. Psalms 139, verse 1 says, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou, hast, thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest me, my thought afar off. Thou compasseth my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Verse 13, he said, For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being imperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, what, which as yet there were none of them. And David says, Oh, how precious are thy thoughts unto me, O oh God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I am awake, I'm still with thee. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the great opportunity to be in this great pulpit, in this church today. I thank you for the word and your power and your might and your glory. I thank you for every time you've touched us in such a miraculous way. Whether we deserved it or not, you've ministered to us and you've kept us and you've helped us and you've strengthened us. I thank you for your mercies and your grace. Minister to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated today. We have come through one of the most troubling times of our generation. We are still in difficulties. We are facing circumstances that are simply unknown in regards to the future. And yet, in the midst of all of this, there is one thing that they are saying and telling us, that depression is rampant. That the isolation has caused us to look inward instead of outward. And yet, the low self-esteem and the down and the unsure are rapidly increasing. And yet, I would submit today that there are people here today that have been depressed. And you, you, you feel like you're not sure exactly who you are and what your purpose is in life. And yet, when I look at the Word of the Lord, I recognize that there were two distinct groups in the Word of God. And yet, in, in the Bible, we read that there was a Jew who was a really benefactor of all the blessings and the heritage and the promises handed down from the, the very beginning of Abrahamic covenant and in then there was a Gentile a Gentile looking outside of the promises wishing they could somehow be a part of a bloodline that they were not born into and yet even Jesus in a time Jesus said to his disciples he said at that time he said don't go to the uh, to the Gentile but rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and I, I don't have time to go into that, but that was a time frame Jesus was discussing. You see, there was a something special about the pure bloodstock and bloodline of Abraham. Abraham had a covenant. 
Abraham had a blessing. Abraham had a promise given to him. In fact, one time Jesus even looked at the Syrophoenician woman and said, it is not good for me to give the children's bread to the dogs. Yet in midst of all of that, I don't believe that Jesus loved her any less. He was just proving a point in that time frame. But yet when I see Paul, Paul giving the clearing understanding that in Ephesians chapter 12, Paul is told, he tells us in the Ephesian church, he said, and at that time, you were without Christ. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in this world. In other words, Paul was saying there was a point where we were on the outside looking into the promises of God. We were on the outside of the covenant. We really had no right to the great opportunity. We were out of the bloodline. We had no hope. You see, there is a power of a bloodline. If you were a Jew, you were the benefactor of all the blessings and the promises handed down through the generations. Even now we see a tremendous blessing upon that nation and people because of a covenant that God gave so long ago. And yet there was something about it. It wasn't because they earned it. It wasn't because of a particular thing that they had accomplished in their own right. It was simply because they were born into it. There was just a birth. They had nothing to do with it in themselves. Just a child that the minute they breathe life, all the benefits, all the blessings of the covenant of Abraham was placed upon them and the purpose. And yet Ephesians 1 said this, Ephesians 1, 4, according as he hath chosen us in before the foundation of the world that we should be holy without blame before him in love. Can I tell you, as I read just moments ago in the book of Psalms, David says this, when I begin to ponder on this, I was chosen. It wasn't something that I did on my own. It was something that God gave me that I did not deserve myself. God chose me, he said. And when I began to comprehend the very nature of that, David said it is too wonderful for me to really understand. Can I tell somebody here today that before Abraham was, before anything about this world began, God knew exactly who you were. God knew exactly your name, every hair on your head, every part of you, he understood. He's already already researched you. He knows everything about you. You are fearfully and you are wonderfully made. God knows who you are. In Lexington, Kentucky, there is something called, it is really a thoroughbred raising country, if you will. There is a thoroughbred and the thoroughbred horse is known as a blood horse. In fact, breeders raising stallions, thoroughbreds, being blood horses. For you see, there's something about the thoroughbred bloodline that's special. 300 years of research developing the bloodline, making sure that everything is exact and perfect. If you today or I were deciding to get into the horse business and maybe even the horse racing business, you'd want to go buy a good colt, but you wouldn't go on eBay. You wouldn't call up a local horse trader and say, do you think you could help a brother out? No, no. No, what you would do is you would hire a bloodstock agent because a bloodstock agent, as far as I'm concerned, if you're going to spend a half a million dollars on a colt, you better know a little bit about that colt. 
and you can't tell what you need to know just by looking on the outside. You need to know exactly what blood flows through that veins of that colt. And you see what a blood stock agent does is this. He begins to look for, he's not really caring about the color of the horse. He doesn't really care about what it looks like necessarily on the outside. He's not concerned whether it's ugly or pretty. For you see a blood stock agent's sole purpose is to research and definitively find out what kind of blood flows through the veins of that colt. They don't care about anything else except what does the bloodline look like. They're not purchasing based upon that colt's particular abilities or achievements. They're not purchasing based on what it looks like. It may look like it's young. It may be a little wobbly at first, but you see the truth of the matter is the bloodstock agent is buying and purchasing the horse and researching the horse, not dependent upon its own victories but what victories are handed down through something called the bloodline you see they're not concerned with the present state all they're concerned with if the blood is right I said if the blood is right it will be a champion You see, they study the mare and the stallion, the leg action, the foot strike, the acceleration, the lung and the heart size. All have been studied thousands of hours. The descendants, oh, what was his grandpappy like? What was his grandmother like? What kind of race did the grandmother or grandparent reign? How were they able? You see, research in detail. For you see, the truth of the matter is this, and it's simply this. What the cult will become has already been determined by the bloodline. They planned it for generations. It's no accident here. So when the psalmist said in 139, he said, you researched me. You know every thought about me. My weaknesses, I am weak, but yet you are strong. The truth of the matter is simply this, that in my weakness and in my, but the truth is, I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. Some of you came here today and you don't like the way you are. You don't like your way you look. You don't like the way you talk. You don't like the way you are. But can I tell you, without a doubt in my mind, you are fearfully and you are wonderfully made. David said, when I begin to ponder this, how precious, how amazing. Can I tell somebody today, your value has nothing to do with the present state in which you're in. We try to, well, you know, let's just be honest, okay? And your pastor's so gracious and kind. He gave me, you know, he told you that I got a position at headquarters. You know what I found out? That my title, General Secretary of North American Missions, and five, or actually it's about 650 now, gets me a coffee at Starbucks. As long as I give them 650, they really don't care about my title. Titles come and go. I remember years ago, had the privilege of youth pastoring. My, really, my first place I ever really youth pastored. It was a very great honor to be with Brother James Carney in Columbia, Mississippi. Outstanding church, great, great people, and, and uh, oh, just a wonderful opportunity. And I was there between my junior and senior year of college, IBC, and, and I was, you know, he, he, Brother Carney came to me. He said, why don't you stay here? And I said, well, Brother Carney, I said, I've only got just a year left. I need to go ahead and finish what I started. And, of course, the whole time in my mind, in, in the back of my mind, I'm going, you idiot. You are going to leave what you are going to go back to school to learn how to do, and you're already doing it. But yet I'm thinking, yeah, but I made a commitment to finish something, and so maybe I ought to do that first. And then, well, by the time I graduated, uh, he had already moved on, had to find somebody else, and so, oh, well. But that 
that church, they, they were blessed with a lot of things and, and, and just amazing things. And, uh, you know, I, I remember going to a youth congress about five years after that and maybe four years later. And I was youth pastoring in a church and we had this massive youth group. I mean, it was huge. We, we could fit all of the youth group, all our luggage, all the youth team in a minivan. And we pulled up at Youth Congress there in Little Rock, Arkansas. And there's a bunch of thousands of people there. And would you believe who pulled up right when we pulled up? It was the youth group from Columbia, Mississippi. And they had a brand new, big old, nice, shiny, we, would, we used to call them Greyhound buses, you know. Big old, nice bus. They start piling out. And I mean, you look at them like, are they ever going to stop? And they see me, and they're, hey, Brother Bill, how you doing? I go, oh, man, it's good to see you all. They said, you here with your youth group? I said, yeah. They said, where? Right there. He looked at me and goes, where? I said, that's it. It was good to see you. I remember thinking, wait a minute. My value is not in my present state. We spend way too much time trying to figure out how we're valuable or not. It has nothing to do with your ability. It has nothing to do with your so-called pedigree. It has nothing to do with who, who, oh, but it has everything to do with whose blood flows through your veins. A half a million dollars for that? It's never been on the racetrack. It doesn't even know which way to run. Why would you spend that for that? Because I'm not buying that. Because the truth is, there was a bloodline that is in place. What he is becoming will only be made because of the bloodline within him. I'm telling somebody, the truth is, there is a bloodline. Jesus Christ, he showed up in this great bloodline. You got 14 generations from Abraham to David. You got Babel, David to Babylonian captivity, 14 generations. You got Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. You've got a, 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 a harlot by the name of Rahab back there. He, he, she's just there. But can I tell you, there's something there that because of who else is in the bloodline, it's not about who you are. It's about whose you are. See, I'm so thankful. You said, well, wait a minute. You opened up by saying the Gentiles were kind of out of it, this thing. And Brother Hobson, I'm not a Jew. And so therefore, I must be out of the bloodline. Oh, well, that, that may have been a consideration. That may have been something that you perceived. But there was something that happened to you. Whenever I am so thankful for the very essence and opportunity that because Christ went to death, hell, and the grave, because of the resurrection morning we celebrated just two short weeks ago, I am so thankful he opened it wide open for whosoever will let him come and drink of the waters of life freely. Well, how? You repent of your sins. You get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you get filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And something happens inside of you. Because Paul told the Galatian church, he said, if you be Christ, Then, are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise? I'm telling somebody, you may be have wallowed around in the mullet grubs for a long time, but it's time to understand who you are. You're a child of God. There's royal blood that flows through your veins. I said there's royal blood that flows through
through your veins. It's not about your victory. It's about his victory. You know, I think sometimes we fail to realize the authority that is within us. Several years ago, I had the privilege of meeting a young man. He was 14 whenever I met him, and he owned the tallest skyscraper in the uh, one of the major cities in North America, and uh, he, he, he owned it. It was in his name because of wealth in their family. He, they had to kind of divest, and that's how they do it, you know. And, and so, I mean, they, his parents are, I don't know, whenever I first met them, they were, they were probably somewhere between four and five hundred million dollars worth, worth in their family, and and uh, just, you know, I got, I got a phone call one day and a lady I had met years earlier, uh, she said, we met years earlier, you may not remember, I said, oh, yeah, I do remember that. She said, well, she said, here's the thing, she said, I'm about to move to Orlando, I pastored there for 12 years, she said, about to move there, and she said, I've got a young man that's going to move, actually, I'm moving to be his guardian. And uh, I said, well, that's, that's neat. She said, yeah. She said, uh, this young man, he says, worth, worth a whole lot, and his parents are, and they're going to buy a house for him to live in, and, and, uh, but they're going to send him to a prep school there in Orlando, and, and uh, they're not from this country, so they can only be in the country 90 days unless they, or they, and they become subject to corporate tax and all that, so they live outside the country, and they're not U.S. citizens, but he is, and, and dual citizenship and all that. And so she said, well, you know, we, we were wondering... She said, how, how, would it, how, how would it affect you and how would you react to have somebody like that come to your church? I said, no problems. I said, I'm not going to tell anybody what, he's, what he is and who he is. If he does that, that's his own problem, but I'm not going to. I'll just treat him like one of my own kids. And so, you know, a few weeks later, we got invited to this multi-million dollar house that had been purchased for him to live in. Drove up to this golf course. It's just beautiful and, you know, one of the leading golf courses in Orlando. And I mean, $50,000 just initiation, you know, a little bit out of my league. $49,999 to be exact out of my league. But anyway, but I'll never forget one day, my, my friend, my 14-year-old friend, and we treated him. We just treat him like it was one of our own. In fact, we'd go over to the house and my kids would play hide and go seek in their house. <laughs> and, and, but one day he said, hey, you want to play golf? I said, sure, let's go play golf. And so we went and played golf. And of course, we're playing in this course that I mean, I, and when I got there, I said, hey, hey, can I, can I pay for it? He said, no, you can't. No, they won't take your money. I said, why? He said, well, because I'm just going to sign it. I said, oh, okay. Never works for me, but anyway. <laughs> so we're playing this course that was a whole lot more than I could have ever afforded, and we're playing there, and this drink cart comes around. I thought, well, here's something I can afford. I said, here, let me pay for this. He said, you can't pay for it. Why? Because they don't take cash. I just signed my name. I said, well, I can sign my name. <laughs> he said, but your name doesn't count. I said, thank you very little. <laughs> and it all of a sudden dawns on me. Here's this 14-year-old kid. He just signs his name. His last name was what mattered. And because he signed his name, I mean, in fact, the next time I went to play with him, I didn't even want to play with him anymore because he went and had lessons. Here I was beating up on this 14-year-old kid playing golf, and next time he was whipping me. I'm like, I ain't playing with you anymore. I can't afford to have pros teach me. 
But he said this. He said, you're in my last name. I got to thinking about that. Well, wait, wait, wait a minute now. The truth of the matter is, when you are born of the water and of the spirit, whenever the presence of God, when God, I believe with all of my heart, when you are repenting of your sins, blood is showing up. But I also believe that when you're getting baptized, blood is showing up. And when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, I believe blood is showing up. But there's something that happens at baptism that's a glorious thing. It's where the name is applied. And all of a sudden, you now no longer just have blood, but you have name. And it's not about your name. It's about his name. So while you think you're insignificant, while you think you're nothing, I want to tell somebody and serve notice, there is a power in the bloodline. When God filled you with the Holy Ghost, he gave you power. He gave you anointing. He That's why, that's why that whole scripture comes to mind. It brings new meaning. In him we move. In him we live. In him we have our being. Why? Because I'm in the bloodline. Because the blood, his blood, now flows through my veins. It's not your victory. It's his victory. It's not your battle, it's his battle. Oh, let me just bring it into our understanding a little bit. Oh, wait a minute. Who's back in the bloodline? Who was a part of the bloodline? Well, Jesus was. Well, who else was in the bloodline? You've got Abraham. There's a faith that Abraham shone forth. That was a miraculous faith. By faith, Abraham. You say, well, Brother Hobson, I don't have any faith. Oh, wait a minute. No, no, it's not about your faith. The faith's already in your bloodline. Well, I don't know if I've got much wisdom. Well, you know, there's a guy by the name of Solomon that just happens to be back there, and he was affected by this old blood. Yeah. Oh, no, I don't have much victory. Oh, that's okay. You got a guy by the name of Shamgar back there. Oh, but I don't have much vision. Well, thank God, Ezekiel, he's back in that bloodline. He, all you have to do, you know, I don't know if my heart's right. Well, you got a heart of David back there. He's in your bloodline. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, I don't know if I can prophesy. Well, you got Isaiah back there in your bloodline. I'm not saying that because they are in the bloodline, it is because of them. What I am saying is because they were in the bloodline. In other words, the only reason the cult becomes a champion is because there was blood flowing through the veins of his grandfather but he has the same blood can I tell somebody that the minute you begin to repent of your sins that precious blood it begins to flow off of Golgotha it flows 2,000 years into the future and it begins to touch you and it begins to transform you it's the blood That's why Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's when his blood flows through. You see, it's in Christ. You're a new creature. All things are passed away. All things become new. Well, I know what some of you are saying. Well, you know, Paul says we were adopted into this thing. And we were. You can be seated, but you know what? Let me just tell you this. We tend sometimes to view adoption as being less than blood. I don't know what it's like in Colorado, but I know most states are like this. You know, we got people going nuts. Anybody around here know that's the truth? They're just kind of out of their minds. I mean, it's like my grandfather, my wife's grandfather, O.C. Crabtree. He died, I don't know, 20 something years ago. He, he used to say, All the squirrels don't live in the trees. Boy, I tell you, that's a truth. <laughs> and they don't, all don't live in Missouri either, you know? But, you know, 
We got such a crazy society. There are kids divorcing parents. Nuts. But, but here's the thing. You, you can kind of, you can skirt your responsibility with your own kids. It happens all the time. And in fact, you can sign parental rights away to your own kids. But there is something about adoption. Adoption, in, in, in many states, that is an irrevocable document. What are you saying? In essence, that becomes even more powerful than the actual bloodline. And so uh, you say, well, I'm a little inferior because I wasn't a part of Abraham. No, no. He said, if you be in Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I was adopted into this thing. He, oh, I'm not preaching once saved, always saved. No, no. But what I am saying is this. Uh, you are no less. Dr. Felix Roux and Louis Pasteur were both doctors in France over 100 years ago. They both, both of them had a desire to prove what they called the germ theory. Dr. Roux, his granddaughter had died from the dreaded black diphtheria. And he became determined to find out what it was that caused her death. They researched, they studied Dr. Rue Lewis Pasteur. They worked hard to find and prove and find the answer to this germ theory. And then finally they emerged with this passion to prove their theory. And of course the medical association disagreed with their, their philosophy and concepts. And so in fact the medical profession of that day cast them out. In fact they were even kicked out of town and banished from the town. But one day, Dr. Rue and Louis Pasteur, they led 20 beautiful horses down to a little lab outside of town. and They invited scientists and doctors and they said, we're going to perform an experiment. We want you to see what happens. They took buckets full of vile, disgusting, disease-ridden buckets and of, 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 of liquid and knowing that it was full of this dreaded disease, black diphtheria, and they, uh, they put it together, and then they began to carefully take brushes, and they brushed it on the nostrils and in the mouths of every one of those 20 horses. Most became just simply dull by waiting, and impatient decided they'd go on home, but all of, after several days, all the horses developed high fevers. And in fact, all of one of them died. Most grew tired of waiting. They left, but yet that one horse kept fighting for its life. After a season of time, after several days of laying there, that horse began to show signs of recovery. And when the fever broke and that horse could stand and eat and drink, Dr. Rue did something that really astounded everyone there. He went over and dealt a death blow to the horse. Quickly taking vial after vial of blood from this horse, he ran to the local town and hospital and pushing his way in to 300 babies that were waiting to die from black diphtheria. One after one, he quickly inoculated every single one of them with the blood of that horse, and then they kicked him out. But before he could be kicked out, he got to every one of those babies. Something miraculous happened. Instead of surety of all 300 dying, in fact, the truth was at the end, all but three of those babies survived. And when they began to research and they began to try to figure out what it was that changed the course of these beautiful babies' future, doctors and everyone present 
had to come to simply the same conclusion. It was because they had all been inoculated with the blood of an overcomer. It was the precious blood. You're a part today of something inside of you. The enemy wants to tell you, you might as well just give up and go home and forget it all. You're nothing. You're nobody. You're insignificant. Nobody cares about you. But wait a minute. You got to remember there was something that happened at Calvary. It wasn't just a death. It wasn't just a conclusion, but at Calvary, three days later, something happened. It was more than just the blood of a spotless lamb, but it was blood from an overcomer. I'm telling somebody in this house today, you are a part of the bloodline. There is a power in the bloodline. If you become a part of it, you say today, Brother Hobson, you don't know my past. Brother Hobson, you don't know. I come from a home of alcoholics. You don't know that the bloodline that I have is full of all kinds of sin and debauchery. You don't know what I've done. Oh, I don't know what you've done, but it really doesn't matter because there's a spirit of adoption in this place that he said, hey, I'm an overcomer. Does somebody want it? Somebody want to be a recipient of the blood? All you got to do is come and repent. All you got to do is be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Oh, come on now. You know what I believe? I believe somebody here today could get baptized in Jesus' name. You know why baptism is so important? People are saying, well, baptism isn't essential and all that stuff. Come on, really? You know what, you know what repentance of sin does? As you repent, God forgives you and the blood of Jesus Christ applied to you. Well, they say, well, that's all I needed. No, I remember as a boy, I was just a young boy and I, I went outside and mom, I was in school clothes and mom said, don't you dare go outside and get dirty. I didn't. I didn't get dirty. I got filthy. I didn't throw the first mud ball, but I had to return it just something in my nature it wasn't my fault they returned two and so I got to return some two and I might as well throw three and I mean before it was all said and done we were covered head to toe in mud mom called and said it's time for dinner I stepped up I knew I was in trouble she said I'd whip you right now but I don't want to get I mean, I'm crying. I'm like, oh, Lord, God, I want to I live. It was just mud. My mom said, all right, just go get washed up. Or no, no, she said, you, you, I'll forgive you. you you're you're going to get to eat dinner and all that, you know, maybe three meals a day, Brett. No, I'm just kidding. But I could sense that mom was going to forgive me. She's going to let me live. So I remember as I stepped to the door threshold, she said, "Uh uh-uh, you're not coming in here looking like that. Well, I'm thinking, but mom, you said it was okay. No, before you come in here, you need to go get all that stuff, get that water hose, and from top head to toe, you need to just take a bath in that water hose. Well, that's what baptism is. God says, I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to forgive you of your sins. But what I need you to do, the next step is you need to go take a bath. All right, praise God. You need to get all that stuff off of you. And by the way, while you're doing it, there's something that's happening. My blood's also showing up. And I'm putting my name on you. And now... 
And not only that, but I'm going to fill you with my spirit. So not only are you just simply forgiven, not only are you washed, but now you really are a child of the king because my blood through, flows through your veins. I'm opening this altar up today. I know we're in COVID. I know we got stuff happening, but I would to God that somebody today would simply say, hey, wait a minute. I need to become a part of that blood. I need to let the blood flow through my veins. I would that somebody that's been filled with the Holy Ghost would wake up and understand you can walk through your school with a new step. You can walk through your job with a new understanding. You are a child of God. You you have royal blood that flows through your veins. Would you stand?